Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we kick off slash return to our longest retrospective we have ever had because we return to it every year and add more movies to it. We return to our Stephen King retrospective with an ode to youth in America and car culture, John Carpenter's 1983 film based on Stephen King's novel, Christine. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have seen it. So warning, spoilers ahead from Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, author of the upcoming Young Captain Nemo series from Five and Friends Macmillan Books. With me from Austin is Tony Sabaggio, tech director at Rooster Teeth Studios, lead singer of the band uh, Deserts of Mars and lead guitarist of the band Rise from Fire. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy. We actually heard a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, Deserts of Mars this week with, uh, you know, Send More Gasoline. It was like <laughs> on our page and, and, uh, and others. Man, I, you know, that's supposed to be metaphorical. I didn't think that austin idiots would make that i i should repost it. i didn't take the time to repost it on the deserts of mars page but maybe i was just in too much just shock and disappointment at dummies doing things like putting gasoline in a trash can to haul around oh yeah oh. but uh yeah we live again send yeah. send more gasoline. shiny and chrome everybody oh. anyway the the, the Thank song you. Thank send you more gasoline that. oh sure but i mean it's so good and the funny thing is it is actually our theme music for this show like ever since the, the our like we entered like a season or two ago we started adding theme music and the theme music is the first eight seconds and it even is literally eight seconds of send more gasoline so if you listen to the song send more gasoline the first eight seconds you're like ah this is the music that goes at the at the beginning of uh of castle of horror so it was it was really cool it was it was fun to hear it beautiful uh okay uh also in Austin is Mr. Drew Edwards, editor-in-chief of HorrorMovies.net, writer for Rockabilly Online, and creator and writer of the long-running comic Halloween Man. Say hello, Drew. And Cheapskate. Don't forget Cheapskate. <laughs> cheapskate. We were, we were actually talking about this before we started recording it. Drew uh, consider, considers himself a, a notorious Jack Benny-esque uh, Oh, oh no, no, no. You don't be fooled by how dapper I am. I am, I am, I am a very, very cheap man. Like yep. it's, it's, it's true. Well, that's an admirable trait. That is. Uh, so is it? That's, <laughs> sure, of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. I, you know, I, I mean, tend if you to. Call, like, if you say cheapskate, it's not. But if you say, you know, um, careful with money or frugal, even I'm frugal, but frugal. Even frugal I like, I like how this is going. I'm. <laughs> responsible financially responsible fiscally responsible yeah, all these things are, <laughs> yeah. and uh that voice finally also in denver as always color commentary from eventually you know what you've been on a horror movie podcast for like six years or more i think at this point <laughs> we can stop calling you color commentary if you were called to the stand i think you could be presented as an expert in horror movies no i, at this I i'm fine with being called color commentary. <laughs> one of us I, yes. I think that is Julia still offers an outsider's perspective. She exactly, does. Exactly, because doesn't. I don't, I don't like horror movies. <laughs> that's what makes so it that's, work. I think that's what makes me color commentary. <laughs> I think that's the best part of this is we're on like movie two hundred and thirty-two or so, and something like that. <laughs> and <laughs> yet, she still think she doesn't like horror movies. <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh yes, Julia Guzman. Some oh. of some of our the comments that julia has given again back in court of law would prove that she does enjoy some horror movies yes some horror movies i do like but i always tell jason i'll be like we should watch whatever and i'm like unless we're watching it for the podcast i am not watching a horror movie <laughs> fair enough <laughs> fair enough uh, that is Julia Guzman of Guzman Immigration of Denver, and you've already been talking, but if you want, you can say hello. Hello. Hola. Hello. Okay. Christine. Christine is a 1983 American horror film directed by John Carpenter and starring Keith Gordon, John Stockwell, Alexandra Paul, the lovely, of Dragnet, uh, and Harry Dean Stanton. The film also features supporting performances from Roberts Blossoms and Kelly Preston, written by Bill Phillips, not the exercise guru, and based on the novel of the same name by Stephen King, the plot follows a sentient and violent vintage Plymouth Fury. I'm sorry, I just have to laugh when I say it's, it's a sentient and violent Plymouth Fury. Uh, named Christine, and its effects on the cars. How else would you describe that, Jason? It's, I know it is. It is indeed a sentient it's a, it's and violent. A possessed, possessed old car. 
<laughs> it's just well, kind of I funny. Ask, ask a question, you get an answer. There you go. The, 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 the thing, the thing about Stephen King is that he often creates horror out of like everyday items, and so when you just say out loud what the story is about. A lot of times it sounds so absurd that it could just as easily be a, a, a skit or something like that. But in Stephen King's hands, it turns scary. But yeah, you know, when 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 he says, you know, a a possessed, uh, you know, a sentient and evil ch- uh, wind up chattering, you know, teeth toy. And yes, there's really a story about that. So. All right. Yeah, it's an evil Plymouth Fury. Let's go. uh, uh We'll reverse from last week. Let's go Tony, Julia, Drew, and then I'll go. Uh, Tony, opening thoughts on Christine. I think it's a solid movie. I hadn't watched it in a pretty long time, but um, I'd seen it fairly regularly. Um, it's a pretty good adaptation. It changes enough things that, I, you know, I wish, again, it, any of King's books, I think, would make sometimes better miniseries or two-part kind of sure. movies. Because there's a lot of stuff. Um, I really enjoy it. It's It turns from, and it's been a long time since I've read the novel as well. It made me kind of want to reread it. Uh, the car itself and how that all happens is different enough that it kind of separates. Whereas the, the book is uh, more of a possession kind of thing. Even more <laughs> supernatural. The movie is, the car is kind of just born bad. And... Mm. It's more about obsession of the car. for the bone, even. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it oh, is bubble man. Bad. Yeah. Uh, and so you know that that changes things, but I think it's a really solid horror movie. I mean, it's hard. I can't think of Carpenter I haven't really enjoyed. So uh, yeah, I, I really I'm glad we're revisiting this one because it's I think it's a solid movie. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Julia. What are your first thoughts? on uh, Christine. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think solid is a good word. I, I was watching it and thinking, not only that it reminded me of a lot of the other, you know, um, Stephen King movies that we've seen or even that we've not reviewed but seen on our own, but it reminded me a lot of um, uh, Fatal Attraction, you know, like this idea that the the car is just an obsessed woman, you know, who, of course, uh, in this case, the the boyfriend is also possessed, but the car is just an obsessed woman who, who's jealous of everybody that's in the life of whoever it is that she's obsessed with at that moment, uh, which in this case now is Arnie, but pri- previously was the owner that um, had her before, and she killed first his wife, uh, child, then his wife, I guess, and then him. I don't know. But anyway, so yeah, I just thought it was really interesting um, if you think of it, because it seems, like you said, it seems silly to read that that's what this is about, but when you actually watch it, in practice, it's really, really not hard to buy that this car is just a, a, a crazy, um, sure. homicidal maniac female. <laughs> so, anyways, it's a really interesting movie. I, I, there's a lot of interesting pieces to it. Excellent, uh, Drew. What are your thoughts? I like this movie a lot. I it's one of my favorite John Carpenter movies. Uh, obviously, as a as a rockabilly enthusiast, I enjoy <laughs> mm-hmm. the, the use of of uh, music, particularly fifties music. Although, uh, you know. I think this might have been the first movie to 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 use George Thorogood as much as I'd like to give the credit to James Cameron and uh, sure. I think I think uh, Bad to the Bone is even used pretty pretty good here. I think we'll give it some some slack because it's the first time, but. You know, obviously a lot of really great 50s music. I enjoy seeing the the 50s cars, the 50 car, the, the Plymouth Fury that is pristine, I should say. And, uh, you know, I actually think that the stuff they change from the novel work to, to the strength of this movie because it becomes more ambiguous as opposed mm-hmm. to a sort of haunted car because the, the novel is a bit more of a ghost story than this is. And I think that the ambiguity allows for a lot of... Uh, you could look at this through a lot of different metaphorical lenses, like the ones that Julia was just saying about how it could be seen as, you know, a, a, almost like a, a stalker or, a, you know, obsessed girlfriend. But you could also look at it as a metaphor for addiction or an abusive relationship. Yeah. You know, teen, yeah. you know the dark side of teen rebellion, obviously. Like, there's a lot of stuff going on in this movie, and I, I, I just – I. I also will say, as a kid, I was always mystified of the scene of, of Christine regenerated and regenerating, and I always, I, I still think that is just such a cool looking. Yeah. Effect. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I found a blog of the a guy who found one of the stunt cars. Did know? he really? 
full of roll cages and everything like that and restored it to be like he took it and they couldn't sell it to him so they had to part it out and this whole thing is really interesting you know what he found when he uh when he bought the car and how much you know just plywood and roll bars and all that stuff it's sure. like because when, when well, you have a stunt car it's not it's not really a, a car like a you know a drivable car that anyone wants to drive in because they've taken out things to make it lighter and all the all the things they do to a stunt car and he actually yeah. restored it he even had the license plate uh was he said was in the trunk the, the license plate from the movie yeah no, they, it says uh that um they had they destroyed about 13 to maybe 16 of the actual classic plymouth um they're not called series they're called the belvedere's i think but anyway is what they were actually using and all, all the people who are you know, the enthusiasts that were freaking out and really mad about that. But <laughs> the rest of them, like the couple thousand I mean, there were, um, have been much more, much better preserved because of that film and because of all that, because people have been like, oh, you know, you've got a Christine, you got to keep it in you know, good shape. They've been bought by people who cared and all that. So yeah, that was interesting. But most, I mean, a lot of the stunt stuff, especially when it gets crunched up and everything, is, is actually plastic cars that they made to look yeah, like it. Well, so he, that they could he, them. Yeah. he talked about how much chrome was actually like rubber and plastic. Like it was no longer yeah. really chrome. And you wouldn't do that. I mean, you you know, you make a lot of exceptions when you make that kind of thing. Um, right. well, the, the, the hero car actually was a Plymouth Fury. The, the, right. the Belvedere, they had to use Belvedere's because the whole reason why Stephen King used the Plymouth Fury is because it was, a, it, you know, it, it wasn't at that point an iconic car. And this, the funny right. thing is, when they, they, when, when they did this movie, now the Plymouth Fury is now kind of an iconic car. Right. So, you know, there, but there wasn't that many of them left. So, uh, you know, highly sought after vehicle in the uh, hot rod community, mostly because of Stephen King and Mr. John Carpenter, of course. So I like how Stephen King will totemize something like he'll he'll take something like he'll pick a particular model of something like a like a Plymouth Fury or, or like a particular, you know, kind of notebook or, or brand of pen or, or whatever it is. And he'll by by chanting it over over and over again through a piece of fiction he'll kind of bestow upon it a, a, a sort of prestige that that becomes magic in in the story i mean it, it it is it is wondrous i mean and there's like a meta work going on here first of all that within the story uh king has made a plymouth fury magic but by the existence of a story the the very name plymouth fury becomes magic to the culture because stephen king is so important i mean that, that right. is that is fascinating to me I will say that I the book to me is a lot I love both but the book is a lot creepier like there mm -hmm. is some stomach churning creeped out gonna turn, leave your light on at night you know I like, haven't I haven't read it I've read parts of it oh man you should totally read it it's it's also you know it does the the rock and roll parts that Drew's talking about you know King often puts snippets of uh you know lyrics between his chapters and such yeah and and i think that's cool that was always cool to me as a you know music lover and eventually musician that like you know that well, the, he's willing to put the things he digs into it in the same way like for example like tarantino you know will cut a mu movie to music or like have ideas for music sure. as he's moving and I, I always think that that process is fascinating because i kind of do the same i have like a playlist when i'm writing and you know for psychom there was a band big business and i eventually gave them comics because i listened to so much big business during the making of psychom that you know you can't tell i think but it's in the fabric of the book to me you know and i th always think that's fascinating there's a there's another movie that uh drew i'm sure you've seen oh god one of my favorites um tony i i don't know if we've talked about this one before but the car which came out oh, actually, yeah everybody should like, watch that's so good like six years before this that one oh my god the car is such a beautiful car i'm trying to remember what what kind of vehicle is in is in the movie the car was it really before but, uh, christine i always oh, saw yeah. it was afterwards oh no, wow. it was before it's 1977 and christine the book doesn't even come out until 1983 which is the same year the movie comes out which is kind of remarkable oh, but wow. um okay it says here the the car in the car was a lincoln continental mark three and it is this because that is a big ass car the the vehicle the car is a satanic and i mean literally like damien omen to satanic lincoln that is just terrorizing this little town for reasons i do not recall it is so great <laughs> it is I, because 
they like smoothed it down so there's no yeah you know, there man, are like that no... cars that's neat <laughs> well, my grandfather owned a continental and it was like a boat like it it when you <laughs> move the steering it just it you just kind of float right i mean it's insane like that car oh man because that was his like Sunday go to mass like yeah. car, right? And so yeah. you get dressed up, you go to mass on Saturday, Saturday evening, and that Continental was just crazy. Oh, you, you go down the freeway on those in those things, and the whole thing just sort of rocks like yeah. it's on waves. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, that you know, land yacht definitely applies when when they talk about land yachts. Like the, those Lincoln yeah. Continentals are. Are that for sure? Sorry, Drew. What were you saying? It's funny this whole genre of like killer cars. <laughs> you know, it's it's, yeah. it's it's a weird subgenre. And you know, like my editor and I on Halloween Man, even you know, we even dabbled with. We were we never finished it. And you know, but like uh, we had a, a comic that we were going to put out. We got into the scripting stage called Great White Black Top, which was about a half shark, <laughs> half car, and oh, it, you know. Before me, before Lava Shark, even believe yes. it or not, like, 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 but you know, like rewatching this movie made me think. It's like, man, you know, we gotta, we gotta dust off Great White Black Shark, uh, like Great Great White Black Top, because that was, that was fun, and killer cars are fun. So yeah, man. Yeah. you totally should do that. Uh, my my only opening thought on this thing is that it's funny because. Um, I think, in my mind, John Carpenter and Stephen King are well matched here. And and the punchline, by the way, is I think it came out well. But but Carpenter himself was not enthused about this movie. He took it as a job. He wanted. He needed some money. He kind of felt like his previous film hadn't been uh, as well accepted as he liked. He wanted to keep his name around. And so Stephen King's a big name, and so he took the gig. And yet... This is a really good job by John Carpenter. And John Carpenter really has a feel for the texture of young people in America. His his Halloween, for me, is just one of the best illustrations of, of being a teenager, uh, you know, in in what, what he presents as Illinois, but basically in anywhere America. This is the same and neighborhood, by the way. They, they filmed this movie in the same neighborhood as Halloween. That's fabulous. That, that's that's oh, really man. fabulous. I would love to see... This is Mike Myers driving around in Christine. Like somebody, <laughs> oh, that's a good mashup poster. Somebody should oh, like there are scenes in here. You where... could you would title it "Cruise in the Neighborhood." Yes, yeah. <clears throat> there there are parts where Christine is stalking victims, and the music, which John Carpenter always composes his own music, and the music sounds like Michael Myers' music, and so oh, yeah. it, it's completely. I love, I love Carpenter music too. So, sure. but you know, you bring that up and the whole taking it. See, this is to me what it what it is to be a professional. Yeah. Like Carpenter did this and he did it for the job, but he's going to make the best movie he can make. Yeah. Like he's going to make a John Carpenter car movie and right. he did that. <laughs> and it's different than the book, but I think he yeah. made, you know, one of the best adaptations and he took it there's not a schlocky oh it's stephen king pop culture you know horror guy it's right. john carpenter making his christine um in conjunction with king and i think that's that's how you do it yeah. you may not oh well whatever i'm just gonna take this job but he doesn't short change it he like the transformation all the parts of the movie look as good as they're gonna look you know yeah. and i think that's that's the real mark that's that's what you do like if you're gonna be a professional and you're gonna be a filmmaker a musician an artist whatever sometimes you take a commercial gig but you know sometimes circumstances are that that you can't make exactly what you wanted to make but in this case he looks at it and goes, okay, what's what's a John Carpenter Christine? Bam. Right. And we get this. And it's awesome. And and, and Carpenter's in, uh, uh, sensibilities are similar enough to Stephen mm -hmm. King's that you wind up with something that you feel is a good companion to that novel. Whereas uh, uh, one of the problems, if I think of two other directors, Mick Garris uh, and Stanley Kubrick, Kubrick's sensibilities are so remote from Stephen King's, that his his Shining is a wonderful film, but is not recognizable to Stephen King as his right. book. Right. And then Mick Garris is kind of a protege of Stephen King, and makes I and I mean no disrespect, but they're very sort of rote presentations of what happens without 
adding much of a flavor. I think Carpenter is sort of a is a wonderful compliment uh, to Stephen King here because he brings his own his is it's like you said it's a Carpenter thing. The fonts are Carpenter fonts. It looks like Escape from New York in the in the font. You know right. uh, the uh, the music is Carpenter music. It sounds like Halloween. Uh, this is it's it's very much as much if you're trying to figure out what shelf to put it on, you, you could put it on either shelf. Uh, and, and it works fine. Um, I should also mention this movie, to, uh, before we talk about the opening, which takes place in 1957, I want to just talk generally about the setting of this film. So the setting, whatever town it's supposed to take place in, I guess it's somewhere in California. Um, the movie takes place in 1978, 20, so that this car is 20 years old the um the book was the book and the movie are both created in 1983 i cannot for the life of me figure out why this movie needs to take place in 1978 does anybody have a really weird choice like jamie and i were talking about the when we watched the movie it's like it's like making a period piece to take like like let's say you had a movie because it came out in like 2001 and you decided to make a movie that takes place in like 1995 which at that point (laughs) is not that long ago you know yeah. the culture unless it's really about an actual crime that much. Yeah. So, yeah does the novel take place in 78 because i can't I'm gonna remember guess that it does I, so, I, so there's yeah. two to me if i had to just guess and throw out a theory i would say that perhaps he's the kernel of the idea started in 78 and the characters he came up with because king will do that a lot he'll have a thing and he'll put on the back burner and then another thing gets made or whatever that he had a fondness for you know his you know, there's like one of the guys who looks like Travolta, but who's isn't, who's basically, you know, Absolutely. one of the sweat hogs, but not. So my guess is that it, it fit with where he wanted to write it, even though it's only five years difference. But five yeah. years difference could be the point where you go, I created, I had this idea in 78, 79, and now it's five years later, I've written a few other things, but I still want to capture that feel because that's the, originally the kernel of the story I wrote. That'd be my guess, but I mean, I don't know. Well, maybe that's well, also, also the, because he wanted the synergy of it being exactly twenty years. Yeah, yeah, that, that is. Great. I guess that's. I, I I guess and and there's also this possibility that I'm going to say this and I'm going to immediately think that it's wrong. But I was thinking for a moment that somehow the late '70s still feel a little more analog than the 1980s. You think of like pop, you know, what people are listening to in 1983. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of like, I don't know, stuff like, like, uh, well, you know, it's new wave basically and and stuff like that. A lot of, a lot of British invasion kind of crap and Thompson twins are coming in and, you know, stuff like that. And whereas 78, you're still like in the arena rock era, you know, and every, and people are still driving cars that can change their own oil on and, and junk like that. So maybe that there's a profound change in the country, at least in the pop imagination, in those five years, I guess sure. I, I really, I, I, it is a mystery to me. I don't know. The best answer I've I heard. I think so they just far, like. I think they no. just like the even 20, 20 year number. I that's, guess that's so. entirely possible. Like <laughs> I, I think so. Well, what's funny is there's still like a lot of eighties hair. Yes. Less, yeah. Less everything is super eighties. The Argyle sweater All that she wears, that mm-hmm. Alexander Paul wears, super eighties. With the exception of the gang guys that who look yeah. who still look seventies, like yeah, but they're still there's still guys that look like that now. I mean, that's sure. some kind yeah, of like I a mean, look that that has never really you know guys with long hair and jeans yeah. with big sideburns and leather jackets. I mean, yeah, that's, right. this can still be the, that's still going to be here thirty years from now. Oh man, I don't well, think I know. I, I'm in yeah. like I'm in a. Does it some Mars is a stoner rock band. Like the shows I go to are pretty much everybody's like, I've decided to say one of my favorite bands. I think we talked about them on the show or I mentioned them somewhere. Uh, Horizon. Those guys are like modern, but are, are like witchcraft or any, any, the, any number of bands you can name that are in like the genre of like stuff. I go, if I go to the lost well or, <laughs> you know, catch a stoner rock band at Barracuda or whatever, <laughs> like it's, it's that those guys pretty much you know um and you see so what's it, yeah, interesting yeah. i don't know if this is an appropriate time to bring this up but what's interesting about the about arnie about the you know the character who owns who buys christine is that he goes back in time in his fashion as he yeah like he as he becomes possessed by christine 
his clothes become 50s clothes. Like, he starts wearing, like, dressing, like, the whole 50s thing. And he also immediately loses the glasses that he obviously needed desperately before because he couldn't even, when they, when they get knocked off of him by the by the mean guys, uh, he actually can't even see where they fell. And now and then he doesn't need them anymore. So Christine takes him over and makes him into a different person, including the best, better eyesight in the, in the 50s clothing. She fixes which is his eyes. To me. That's pretty great that she fixes yeah. his eyes, yes. Well, uh, yes, like she gives him the Wolverine. Turns out you can polish a turd. Right. Yeah, <laughs> so. You know, uh, so we'll... Well, I want to spend a little bit more time in a second on his transformation, but uh, I, I just wanted to cap this off, this note about what it looks like, what the place looks like. The place looks like Carpenterville, because John Carpenter makes no attempt whatsoever to make it look like the 1970s, no attempt whatsoever to make it look particularly like the 80s. It is just a sort of, a sort of kind of contemporary small timeless, town timeless. yeah well it looks like late 70s early 80s but i mean in small town look people keep the same haircut for like 20 years in a small town so so but it, it, he's making no attempt whatsoever there's no like if if zombie had if they had said hey rob make this thing look like 1978 there would be no argyle sweaters he would he would have art directed every square inch of everything to make sure that there was that there was no deviation i can guarantee right. you in 1983, would you really think that way? Because 1978 wasn't that long ago. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. I, I, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I, I actually, it's a really solid question. I don't know. And other than them saying 1978, and that you know, and then there's the scene on New Year's, you know, New Year's Day. You yeah. know, that's a good point. 1979. They don't really deal on what time it is. Like it's not. Yeah. A lot that's of a good point. Because if you ask me. If you ask me what the difference is between today and 2012, there's no way I'm coming up with fashion choices that are different. <laughs> I'd be like, well, I don't know. I could look at some magazines, I guess, but it's not. You did, you would have to art direct the crap out of it, like you said, and like look at all the all the yeah. actual, you know, magazines and catalogs. Yeah. So okay, uh, enough enough on that particular thing. This movie begins. Um, Drew, you were calling out the excellent use of uh, of rock and roll um of all uh, actually uh, we open in 1957 with the 1958 cars on the production line and um uh care uh, uh carrie sorry christine is a red plymouth that injures or kills two people right away and before we but i have one question though real quickly the music this is the first time that they that they have a rock and roll music cue Tell us about the tr the music that's used in this whole thing. I mean, what would we call this? Is it all doo wop? Is it all is it, is it actually rockabilly? Like, what is all well, this? Well, most of the most of the, the the music would would be proper. I mean, they have Buddy Holly, which is is considered rockabilly, but and, and um, Bad to the Bone is completely different. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Well, yeah. Bad to the Bone is sort of Bad to the Bone. That's... I you know George Thorogood dabbles in a lot of different stuff, but I would call George Thurgood Roots Rock, which, yeah. but um, he's retrograde enough that I think it works. I mean, it's not as on the nose as having like, say like, oh, you know, the Stray Cats or something, which would have been contemporary of, of this movie. Well, also, you know? George Thorogood as used is not, it's, uh, George Thorogood is non-diegetic. I mean, they don't hear George Thorogood, we hear it. But I yeah. mean, when Christine plays the radio, she plays That's, '50s music. Generally. Yeah, well, it's kind of how she talks, you know. Yeah. And you know, but they use, you know, the, the you know the music they use is a lot of different genres. I mean, they have little little Richard, which would be R and B, I guess, you know. And you have, mm. you know, a lot of do. We have a lot of doo wop, a lot of, you know, a lot of, you know, you know, you know, what, what, you know early, early, early soul music. But I mean, it, here's the thing: there's a line at the very end of the movie where the girl says. God, I hate rock and roll. And the thing <laughs> is about music from this time period is it really was like all these different things that were coming together to form what we think of as rock and roll. So I think if we're going to be proper, you know, it would be completely okay to just call this all this stuff rock and roll. But, Interesting. Um, okay. But, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different sounds going on, you know, like – 
I, in a, used all very well. Like, uh, you know, like I think uh, my favorite use of any song, well, I don't know, I'm torn, because I love them using uh, Keep It Knockin', because they use that twice. It's a Little Richard yes. song. It's actually my favorite Little Richard song. Yeah, and yeah I, that was I, so I love, funny, because like, like you said, she uses that to communi- her music to communicate, and so both of those times it's somebody who she doesn't want in the car, is getting in the car, and so she's like, no, go away by playing that music. <laughs> I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. And well, I mean, I but they love, play Dion. Uh, Dion yeah. doing "I Wonder Why," and that's very much a doo-wop tune. And there's, you know, but um, yeah, I, I like what you said. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and take it under my. On, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that and run with it. That you can call all this stuff rock and roll. Um, and it's the purest rock and roll because this is like rock and roll when it was born. You know, right. like, like, like like that '50s rock will always be the epitome of rock to me because that is like undiluted by decades of genres and subgenres you know because like when these people were creating this music they weren't thinking oh i'm gonna i'm gonna be rockabilly oh i'm gonna be this you know like they were just going out and making music and you Mm -hmm. know it's it's really you know what we've gone back and done and what radio and you know marketing you know, they've created all this, like, stuff around it, you know, but, like, this was, this was you know, youth culture at that time, and, you know, I, I think that's the reason why it works so well in this movie, because, like, part of what it's commenting on is teen rebellion, and music, mm-hmm. of course, plays a big part in that. Mm. It's so funny that teen, Re- that I agree with you, I was just thinking about the fact that the music stands for teen rebellion, and to a great extent, it will stand for that in this film. And yet it is the voice in a way of Stephen King, who is by no means a rebel. I mean, Stephen King, maybe at some point, but Stephen King is is the epitome of the man. I mean, he's the most powerful writer on the earth. But he wasn't Isn't that interesting? That. I mean, he wasn't always that. Right. He was, you know, he was a guy That's who wrote exactly good, right. about good Americana, uh, yeah. rotten, like the rotten underbelly of Americana, specifically mm-hmm. East Coast Americana. I mean, that's, and yet that's with a ins- great love for it. That's, yeah, that's what I love is that he writes about that rotten underbelly, and yet he very much also kind of he's kind of celebrating in a sense. And yeah, I Tony, you're totally totally right. Stephen King was broke, didn't have a dime to his name. He was double shifting as both a teacher and like working in a laundromat and writing his first book on an ironing board. I, I, I hey, all respect. Also, <laughs> you know, an important thing to think about. Everybody yeah. was a teenager at one point. So two yeah. things always struck me. Well, a like it's it's interesting that he so Lovecraft wrote about the East Coast with a dread for anything that wasn't was below his standing, basically. Yeah. Like and there it's funny to have two authors because of course King wrote about Lovecraft and you know he, he uh enjoys his work. But it's funny to see two authors, you know, d- you know, definitely different time periods, but who's you know, one of them loves the working man and the other one just despises the working man. I can't That's believe right. you know? and then also, you know, when you're talking about rock and roll, one of the things that I always find interesting is um, in the documentary about Lemmy of Motorhead, uh, yeah. he talks about, he's like, I remember a time where there was not rock and roll. Yeah. Before there was a time period, I grew up, my, you know, my parents didn't have rock and roll. There wasn't rock and roll at all. Right. And he always, he never called him, he never called Motorhead a metal band. He said, we're Motorhead. We play rock and roll at every yeah. gig. And I just find that fascinating. There's a time you, you, we think it's ubiquitous now, especially when you have a movie like this, where there's, you know, rock and roll. 50s rock and roll in it but there was a time not too far before when yeah. christina supposedly created that that was not a thing at all like you had like big band and whatever but there right. was not there was not a thing rock and roll and that's I, that i find fascinating you had pop you had yeah. you had popular music by which we mean basically crooners and then you had um you know you know th- that'd be nice stuff that you'd listen to when you went to dances and yeah. you know jazz and country and yeah. then yeah and then uh, uh well and and yeah. you know you had a lot of what rock and roll comes out of is what they would have called you know well of course you'd have like roadhouse blues yeah um right. which would be the you know the african-american quote and then there there's what they called hillbilly music yeah and you know like you, you talk about the working man like that's that's two sides of the racial divide and yeah. you know like like on the on you know the, the lower end of things and that's really you know, those things coming together mutated into what we think of as, because rock 
and roll is so uniquely American because it is a melting pot music. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to, to, you know, think about, especially with everything we've got going on, because look at what the awesome thing that this country created, which is yeah. rock and roll. And, you know, that took over the entire world. And, you know, I, I, I think, you know, rock and roll kind of signifies something toxic. And of course it, it can be, but in this film, it is, does kind of signify as something toxic. And, you know, it is, of course, rock and roll. Isn't that things. interesting? It's called the, devil, the devil's music. But, you know, I also think there's something very awesome about rock and roll. And I know Tony probably feels the same way. Well, I mean, there's uh, what you said is so fascinating to me because Stephen King, let's jump straight to, okay, the car's born evil and it kills some people. We jump to Arnie, who is a complete nerd. We meet him. He can't walk straight. He falls down like every three feet. He's an idiot, you know, and except for he's really good at math. He's a classic. Well, he's a yeah, classic. Super. Yeah, he's a classic nerd. A classic, classic nerd. And uh, his good, his good buddy, for reasons they don't get into in the in the movie, um, his good buddy though is a popular jock. So great, no problem. And very early on, uh, Arnie sees this this uh, beat up old ruined car. And what I th what I think is interesting is that you would think, given Stephen King's interest in the in the under uh, the underdog, that what will happen is that Arnie will be transformed and become something great. And, uh, and and I don't mind getting into spoilers here, but that, that this will be about him proving himself to all those people who thought that he was worthless. And likewise, that rock and roll, which is so wonderful to Stephen King, and great cars, which are so wonderful, will be the key to redemption. But that's not what's going to happen well, that, at all. No, no that's sort that's... of what happens. It's just that he becomes a bad guy. But he does become tough and, like, he's not intimidated anymore. He's not going to be pushed around. He's certainly not going to be beaten up. Um, right. So that part does happen. And, by the way, we should mention that, um, that Arnie – Played by Keith Gordon, who is the same person who was in uh, Jaws two, which we did a couple weeks, a few weeks ago. Really? So, yeah, he was uh, one Jaws of the. Three. Jaws You're thinking of Jaws three? We did Jaws two probably a year ago. Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. No, we did Piranha two last week, and then yeah, that's what it is. Yes, Jaws yeah. two we did last year, right? But uh, but yes, he's in that. He's in that movie as well, which is kind of funny. But um, but no, he. I think he's totally. I mean, I think it definitely is that he um becomes the nemesis of these guys and uh. He will be their undoing eventually, or at least the car will. Um, but it's not, yeah, he's not a hero by any stretch of the imagination. He's just now um, a formidable adversary, as it were. Yeah. It's like Stephen King is not trying to say, hey, inside every nerd that gets pushed around, there's a hero just aching to come out. He seems to be saying inside every nerd that gets pushed around is a vengeance demon that will wind up destroying the town because that's, <laughs> that yeah. happens in Christine, in, uh, in Christine, but also in Carrie, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, I think that Stephen King talking about kind of what happens as a teenager, when you do start to kind of find yourself as your own person, person and you yeah. start to find your identity and for some people that's very liberating and an amazing experience and for other other people it does send you down kind of a dark because if you look at what happens with arnie he does yeah. start out he just becomes more confident and you know, yeah. he's able to stand up to his parent. He's able to finally ask out a pretty girl. You know, yeah. he, he, you know, he, he, if he had just stopped there, he probably would have been okay. It's because he takes it too far. Yeah. You know, he go, he go, he goes past you're... confident. And he goes past confident, and he becomes arrogant. He becomes, he becomes, becomes violent. Yeah. This is where your addiction metaphor is so is is spot on, Drew. Because when somebody um, starts to use, you know, a drug, they might feel confident, they might feel good, they might feel like, okay, you know, or, or drink, but probably drinking is a better example, you know, where they're like, yeah, I'm going to ask people out and I'm going to, you know, I'm like all that and a bag of chips and whatever. And then the more they do it, the more they destroy their lives and eventually maybe lose everything if they're, you know, bad enough, if they're addicted enough. So I think that's a really good, um, a good metaphor in this case. Well, I think, you. you know, we covered it before. Trick or Treat, I think, owes a lot to this movie. After watching it again, I was like, oh, man, you know, the, um, a lot of that's that a good point. Um, stuff that happens. And I think, you know, 
It's funny talking about, you know, getting that power. I always said that if, uh, you know, back in the satanic panic days, if, if Dungeons and Dragons actually gave you, if you could get all these secret powers and have Satan work for you and stuff, the landscape of high school would be so vastly different. Yeah. Like, nerds <laughs> would own all the things and jocks would be, you know, getting magic swirl. Like, the, if it actually worked the way that religious zealotry said that <laughs> the Dungeons yep. and Dragons worked, it would be so vastly different. It's It, it didn't, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> in case but you're, you're right. Wondering. Nerds <laughs> like, would have been putting jocks literally through walls. You know, they would yeah, have been like, like fusing it, them. It would right. <laughs> have a bevy of barbarian cheerleaders or what, any any number of things, you know, yeah. they would have, you know, every episode of a thing on their crystal ball or, you know... It, Whatever nerdly things that you liked, the, the landscape would be vastly different. And I always found that fascinating. Like, oh, they get you get powers. Like, no, nah, I don't. I, you know, we're still getting pushed into lockers and, you yeah. know, beaten up outside of class. I don't. I didn't get power one from Dungeons and Dragons. I got, you know, I had good friends and had some cool times, <laughs> but uh, or at least yeah. fun times. That I don't know if it was that cool <laughs> in the traditional sense, but. Yeah, nobody was getting super satanic awesome powers that I knew of. Hey, maybe some other schools were full of. Or you were just, nerd, you were just working warlock. around in shop class where you could you could get yourself uh, you know a a bitch and possess yeah uh, for or uh, plummet fury yeah to uh, <laughs> kill your enemies with. I have yet to meet a nerdy warlock like real like i started dungeons and dragons and now i am a warlock i don't know if i want to do that maybe but i have yet well, to... that you again that you know of because i mean it's that very I know possible of. exactly to exactly your magic that's what i'm saying your back i have Every... not met that person everything's that's different now. out there Nowadays, cool kids. I mean, every every everything is different. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, everybody's aware of comics. Cool kids playing D. Uh, the the world is a uh, is a uh, sort of a double reversed place. That is, it, it, yeah, it, nothing's recognizable to what it was then. Um, for the most for the most part, in that respect, pretty awesomely, you know. Oh I yeah, no. Are, are, are <laughs> those those are improvements. And, yeah, that's true. And that's totally that's true. Awesome, because they aren't getting you know, harassed, or at least not for that. I guess they can get harassed on the internet for totally different reasons. <laughs> but it's but interesting to me that. That, that like, if you watch this and early on, I think you're, you're meant to believe as we're following the story of, of Arnie the nerd and he finds this beat up old car that he wants to restore. Nobody else has the vision for it, but he has the vision for it. So you're led to believe that, that this is our hero. But it will come to be that our hero is go is the popular kid, and we're going to learn. Yeah, you know, we never should have given that nerd a chance. That's just a really—it's a twisted. <laughs> well, I think it's more. I think it's more. Be, beware of the of. It's like uh, you know, um, what do they say about uh, a woman who's been um, wronged? That's the expression about. Uh, uh, hell hath no fury. Like a woman yeah, scorned. Yeah, hell, hell hath no fury. Like a woman scorned. It's like hell hath no fury. Like a nerd who's been, you know, beaten up. It's like don't, just no mess yeah. with the nerds because they will come back with a vengeance. I now, guess that's, that's it. On well, you know, you're, you're, I think I think Arnie's. What happens to Arnie though is played more tragically though. Like it's not well, like he's like a boo hiss villain because like most of the people who get killed, like yeah, it's a bit much that they get murdered for being bullies but they're not that sympathetic and, no that's true you know and and the friendship between these two guys is actually you know i mean it's juvenile they behave the way teenage boys do but it's actually really sweet you know the, yeah, the, the, the what we see of them together at the very start of the movie and you don't actually see like i thought this was a really realistic friendship between which is weird because they are kind of a mismatched pair but apparently they both have this, you know, they, they, they make you believable because they apparently both have this love of cars and they met through their shop class. And yeah. I, I, I think that that, that that relationship is really great. And, you know, what happens, you know, when, when, when you know, eventually, you know, popular kid, I can't remember his name, but, you know, the, 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 his, the friend realizes this, that Arnie is too far gone. That's really yeah. sad, you know, like, cause you yeah. can tell he actually does love this guy. Dennis, 
the character's name is uh, is Dennis. Yeah, um, and he's so Stephen King has a couple types that he returns to a lot, and I think we'll see parts of Arnie and Dennis again and again in other stories. Like for instance, the fact that Dennis is a big football star that chicks dig. But he is injured, and so he'll spend... We'll just move back and forth around this movie all the time. He is injured, and so he spends a lot of time laid up, and he slowly has to sort of define himself as something other than a football star. Um, He's injured, and I can't help but wonder if Christine didn't influence that, too, because the reason he's injured is because he gets distracted when he looks over and sees that Arnie is making out with the girl that he had asked out, and they're standing in front of Christine. So... Yeah. You gotta wonder if part of that isn't just Christine making things happen differently than maybe they would have well, otherwise. That's, because... that's one of the reasons why I think that the you know stuff like that works to me a lot better in the movie than it does in the book because there is a level of ambiguity there. Because yeah. in the book, Christine is haunted. She's haunted by the ghost of the original owner. You know, whereas okay. this right. is a much more John Carpenter like. In a lot of ways, Christine is like Michael Myers in the first yeah. Halloween. Like, there's no reason for Michael Myers to be what Michael Myers is. He's just he's evil. Just, <laughs> he's just evil, and Christine is just bad to the bone. You know, like yeah, she she's was, just evil. Like, that, that's, I don't, Jason, yeah, Jason started to allude to the the opening scene, but I don't know that we actually described what happened, unless I missed it. Um, which is that the first guy, one of the people working on, in the factory, in the car factory, get, puts his hand on, in the car at, with the hood open, and then the hood just slams shut and he loses his hand. And the other guy just dies of presumably inhaling um, fumes from yeah. the, pla- the yeah. melting plastic or something. I don't know, but he just dies inside of Christine. So it's like there's no – I was wondering if they were going to start with some kind of curse or something was going to happen, but nothing. It just is. It just rolls off the assembly line evil. And I think yeah. that is definitely the John Carpenter flourish here, you know, because, yeah. like, Stephen King – and I'm not saying either is wrong. Like, you know, to, it, it works. The book is a lot more ghoulish, and I think that that works because you have those wonderful Stephen King, uh, you know, the, Stephen King has a way of wording things, and he narrates things in a certain way, and I think that it works really well in a book. I think this is the right way to do it in a movie. Like, I, I, I just, I think that it allows, like, that, that ambiguity makes it interesting as a talking point. Well, well, one of the things that that occasionally people complain about in novels lately is uh, so-called essentialism, which is where you are blaming people, where you where you set up the story where a character inherently is one way or the other. They are evil, they are heroic, or whatever. And I think that's I, I think that's a perfectly fine complaint sometimes. But I think sometimes being essentialist is great. I think there are such things as monsters. I think it's okay if a monster is pure evil occasionally, you know. And I and I'm I'm just fine with the notion that Christine, like, there's no like possibility that Christine could be lulled into being a benevolent creature. That's not going to happen. Not benevolent, <laughs> right? You know, she's you know she's just. A couple of nice because episodes is, away from being Herbie the, the Long more, Yeah, the more I think about it, the more I like the fact, the idea of Christine being a drug or alcohol, because you can't make, you can't, I mean, yes, you can use drugs for medicinal purposes, but you can't make heroin suddenly be good. You know, because heroin is heroin. It's not going to well, ever, about, like, not be heroin. Think about why people get drunk. You talked about alcohol uh-huh. earlier. The reason why alcohol affects people the way it does is because it's poison right. and your, your, your body you feel the way you do when you drink because you've been poisoned and right. sometimes you get to the point where you die and that's right. exactly what happens to our <laughs> exactly yeah yeah no that's a, that's a really good point uh okay so uh i like the fact that basically the guy that the, Okay, let's talk a little bit about the history of this car. The, his, the car was born evil. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna say this about the chronology, and then you tell me if Jason, you're not supposed to think about this that hard. But okay, old man who sells the car says, "My brother died in that car." I'm putting a bunch of scenes together, but what we put together is, "My brother died in that car. He was in love with that car. He bought it brand new. Uh, it killed his entire family, and he killed himself in the car." The car is 20 years old. This man is about 76, whatever. So that that means 
he would have been in his 50s in 1957 if his younger brother was a little bit younger. Maybe his brother was... So that means that a, a man in his late 40s with a wife and kids, presumably, yeah. bought a car in 1957 right. and has kept it for 20 wife years. And a, and a small child, because the child dies in it when, when she's five, right. I think. All of that just seems totally confused to me. I mean, if I, I just... It, yeah, please. If I may, Jason... I I'm, d- I'm done, so go ahead, please. Yeah. I don't think that this guy is literally supposed to be as old as the actor is. I think that there's supposed to be that this guy got beat up by Christine, because he's got a back brace on. Oh. Um, he looks very decrepit, yeah. um, like he's on his last leg. I think you're supposed to sort of read in the still, between the lines there. But there's nothing wrong with the idea, because I don't believe for a second that the owner of Christine could have met a woman fallen in love with her, gotten married, and had a child while they had Christine. I do think that he gets Christine while he's got a child and a, and a wife already, because I just don't see Christine allowing somebody to get married and have a child. Well, um, and, and so I think that that, the Do they say that he's the original owner? Yeah, they do. They yeah. say he bought it right off okay. the line. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. I, I think it. I. I have a feeling that I, I started down this path, but I have a feeling it's a fruitless path. Well, the thing, I, I think the thing that, that I wonder about. Is when they yeah. first see Christine, Christine is in pieces, essentially, barely using. But re- yeah. Christine, the thing about that is most notable about Christine is Christine is a car that can self repair. Yes. Right, but Christine Why has no motivation to, to do that, that because she, she's depressed. I mean, honestly, I think she's just, she's lost her love. Or she you killed her love, whatever. Let her, or Christine has let herself go, maybe I, emotionally. Yeah, I think she's much. depressed. I think finally she meets somebody who is worthy of her fixing herself up for. And so then she then she wants to repair herself. But up until that point, I think she's just like, well, this sucks. You know, my life sucks right now, so I'm just kidding. Yeah, I like I like I, this idea. I, I like that. It, I read it more of there. It's some of that, but also in the kind of faith, like. <clears throat> You need somebody who has the faith in you. They're like, oh, you look at me like that. Like, so less Right, and that's actually what he says. Arnie says that when he's more. driving. Yeah, and le- less depression and more like, oh, you're you're enamored with me. Oh, like, the you know, the reason somebody will, will kind of let themselves go, maybe not in depression, but like, oh, well, I'll, you know. And they, they, it becomes a symbiosis, right, mm-hmm. where she needs that person. The older guy doesn't give that to her. Right. Now, but that's so, still the depression, and then this is the way out of the uh, depression is because somebody finds sees her as having sees the the, the potential in her, and and now she's like, oh, okay, great. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Arnie says all that when he's um, driving with Dennis, and he's like, uh, you know, love means you know you believe in uh, you know love is believing in some someone, and they believe in you, or whatever, some kind of thing. And he's like, and you feel that way about uh, what's the girl's name? That's uh, Alexander Paul. Um, I'm gonna say Alexander Paul. I, I don't remember. Yeah, her. And he's like, you believe you feel that way about her. He's like, oh God, no. Or he doesn't use. The <laughs> but anyway, he's like, no. I um, he uses the F word by the way because they wanted the movie to get an R rating, but there wasn't enough violence in it, and so they had to add a bunch of F words so oh, that they God. could get an R rating. So, <laughs> but anyway, he's like, uh, no. I'm talking Lee. about Christine. Uh, Alexander Paul's yeah. name was Lee. By the way, Lee, Lee Cabot. That's right, that's right. So yeah. that scene in the book actually becomes this, and this is how they diverge. Is um, he starts to see more as the original owner, like, but all he's when when you see him as that, he's like decayed and like really creepy. And the, the really? description King lays on is creepy and gut wrenching. Um, mm-hmm. It's amazing piece of horror in those, especially those moments. And that's I think where how similar you know, that is to uh, The Shining. Where Jack, as he as he kind of takes on this role, he becomes very uh, uh, very jealous, and and you know very interested in guarding the hotel. The hotel is the most important thing. He's getting snappy at people who are going to interfere with his relationship with the hotel, and he becomes right. more and more like the guy who used to have the hotel. This is a thing with King, and I, I don't even know exactly what it means. I just think it's really interesting that he's. He's fascinated with getting obsessed with your work, and that makes well, sense for some. I mean, to. I think that <laughs> is a, I mean, as a writer, you don't work two jobs and write unless yeah. you're about writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, and yeah. yet, all those things are benevolent for King. They give, they, they do. Uh, they, they, there's nothing about Arnie and Christine that is doing a great favor to the world. He hasn't. Arnie and Christine are not contributing to the culture, and yet Stephen King is contributing to the culture. I agree with well, you. But I he's think... still, remember, he was also an alcoholic. So everything Stephen King does about addiction comes from his alcohol addiction, not necessarily his writing addiction. Mm-hmm. True enough. That's true. 
Yeah. And, and he really was. I mean, he talked a great deal about um, he was the kind of alcoholic who, who would hide bottles all around the house because he was trying to hide how much he was drinking and, and um, you know, and at various times how much drugs he was doing and and that his family actually finally confronted him with just this like bushel of empty, <laughs> empty oh, bottles. Uh, yeah. I lived in my apartment in Savannah when I was going to SCAD. Uh, the guy had actually died in the apartment, and oh, uh, he had a lot of problems. I mean, he evidently was an alcoholic. We were finding hidden bottles, and it was not a large apartment at all. We found really? bottles for months, like in cabinet places and everything. It was so bizarre. Like, it was really yeah. sad. It made me like it sounded like a really bad deal. Um, you know, a lot there was a lot of it didn't sound great. We only got part of the story. But yeah, I mean, we would find just uh, all kinds of bottles in just nooks and crannies, and it was weird. Isn't that awful. Um, yeah, and it was really sad. I, I you know, I, I found it. It was disturbing. You know. Well, and as with the story, you know, that kind of like hardcore addiction, it ravages you. In the end, you can't hide it because it ravages your voice. It ravages your teeth. It ravages your body. You can't hide that you're being eaten away by something. You know, and okay. and. And uh, that's what goes on with Arnie, too. We start to see Arnie has huge bags under his eyes. You know, he's um, he's a little sweaty, you know, basically. There's Isn't there a thing in the book? I think I, I read like the first quarter of the book. I don't know what happened years ago. But isn't there a thing in the book where he's also uh, this guy that he's working for, the one who says, hey, do some odd jobs for me, start delivering stuff, isn't there's something criminal going on with Darnell. Yeah, yeah, I think it's. I think eventually it's drugs, if I remember correct. Okay. But yeah, right. they changed that. It's still a fascinating. Like the the guy who plays is, you know, he's a really great character actor. Like that that actor, you feel fully yes. on the. Not everything's on the up and up. And here's a guy who's like willing to get <laughs> a chance. He's got like a soft spot, but he's also, you know, you you know something seedy is about that guy. He's got a patently seedy vibe. Yes. Um, they play it to the Robert level. Prosky really. is his name, by the way. He's in a hell of a lot of movies i mean cigar chomping uh, yeah. kids but but you know i guess you're an okay kid because i was a kid once kind of like all of the stuff with him in the movie is also super great yeah um, <laughs> he owns the outside of shop and he's willing to give this kid you know the guy knows that there's no way this kid's uh you know parents are cool with this you know yeah. and he's going to give him a chance anyway because he's got his own thing he needs to you know get taken care of you know here's a fresh face and a you know patsy for all this so why not yeah i thought I didn't care for the fact that they stuck that in, that he has to, Arnie has to go and work, like that he has to keep Christine in that garage and he has to work there just because the parents won't let him keep it there and, and whatever. I just, I felt like it was very contrived, like, okay, we need to have a set that we can control. In fact, they use that garage to repair the Christine. The, the, the little side note is that um, the transmission for that car had, was a button like you're supposed to push buttons you know for drive and reverse and, reverse, and it never would work <laughs> so they're always having to fix the dang the dang cars but anyway so they actually used that garage as where they were fixing all the christines as well but i just didn't care for i just felt like that was all very contrived that they have to keep us here and he has to come back and oh. work here so that he's always just kind of i don't know i i didn't i didn't buy that part it's part i mean it's part of the book you know stuff happens oh, to his family as well yeah if i remember correctly like stuff because stuff, stuff happens to his family oh man i just need to go back and reread the book you're right though because it did say on the imdb that he uh what you say the guy's name is robert uh no what's his name the actor? Prosky. P-R-O-S-K-Y, Prosky. Right. Well, yeah. he um, that he asked for more lines and suggested that they throw in the lines about how he could, you know, come and work and, and like, put toilet paper tubes, you know, put toilet yeah. paper tubes and whatever. Um, and so he, they actually threw that in from the book because he wanted more lines. So I guess so. I don't know. I just didn't care for it. But but he's a good character. He's really sweet. And you feel really bad when he... Um, yeah. Gets, when As presented in the movie. Really sweet. Like, he's... It's, yeah, I mean, he, he comes off a little bit of that because he's willing to give the kid a chance kind of guy. But he's also like, <laughs> he's doing not good things and he's letting this kid, you know, I, I think it's a really interesting character. The guy plays it to the hilt, though. I really, really, some great yeah, character. With the, the chewing, like, right, like the chaw chewing and everything yeah. and the spitting and the fact that he seems to be wearing overalls that are like basically held together by grease, you know. I mean, it's the garage. I mean, that's what you'd expect, sure. you expect, know? yeah. No doubt about it. But his criminality is completely removed in this film. He, he There's no, 
I mean, it's already two hours long or whatever it is. They don't have time to to also deal with the fact that he's apparently a local drug kingpin or something. But that would explain how it is that Arnie has gone from complete nerd to now um, a pretty wealthy kid because he's got all these, you know, sweet wads of cash and and he's got the the newfound you know, Satan charisma that, that Christine is filling him up with. Some of it's there, like, some of um, it's not. He's like the, sp- the dark spider, black Spider-Man or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, or like when, he when he becomes Venom, like pre yes. yeah. Venom was a thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. That's, that's true. <laughs> um, well, I think, uh, I mean, it's it's interesting too. I, I found it fascinating, Julia hit on a little bit, that he, he still is against the like gangster, the 70s gang guy, who are 70s gang. Yeah. But he becomes basically a greaser. <laughs> yeah. Like, yes. It would have been yeah. like, it's like the 50s analog of those guys. But since he's right. always been a nerd before that, you know, they're antagonistic still. Yeah. And I, I thought that was right. interesting. And he's like now the outsider guy, but he still doesn't fit in with like those yeah, guys. He's like a T bird. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. But it, it's a, it's a weird look, by the way. I, I just have to say that as far as greasers go, he does look kind of strange. He seems to have. Well, he's I'm not the saying 80s it's version wrong. of a greaser, to be honest. But, like if you look at what he's wearing. A, a what version? Yeah. 80s. Yes. Yeah. He's got he's got a black like members only jacket and that he wears a t-shirt under and I guess some regular jeans like some black jeans. He does not look particularly cool. I'm not trying to mock this guy. I'm just saying that like he doesn't he looks odd. He just looks very strange in these clothes and and I never really quite buy him as as a tough. But it's okay for impressing Alexander Paul, so you know that's okay. He well, and um, again, I think. I mean, I think. Well, I guess that doesn't make any sense. I was gonna say, I almost think that he's got a spell on him that 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 affects other people and how they see him, like a glamour. But it was really, really wouldn't make sense that Christine would be making it easier for him to pick up women, given how jealous Christine is. So maybe that doesn't make any sense. I, don't oh, know. I think it's I, which yeah. is again. Well, I mean, you know. I don't, how much after they bought twenty three vintage Plymouths? Like how much left did they have for for costuming? I mean, most of the clothes <laughs> there, most of the clothes here does not look like it. Just looks like you know clothing that the actors could have could have yeah. brought from their house. I mean, it's enough of a greaser look to where you get the idea that he. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. like, yeah, it's it's not like super authentic, but it's also at the same time like he doesn't look like uh like a member of like the meteors or like you know like <laughs> something that would have been you know like a no, like, but he's like still a, a James great... Dean thing going. No, yeah, he no, but I'm yeah. saying like like he, he, you know like there there was like the sort of punked out you know rockabilly look uh, that was actually right. happening at that time period and he doesn't look like that but he doesn't exactly quite look like a like authentic 50s greaser either you know he's just, doing his he own thing looks, yeah yeah he yeah. kind of looks like he's trying to take clothes he has and make it look like right that, which i think is yeah i think it's fine you know yeah. like i you know like if he suddenly had this like really awesome like rock and roll wardrobe like i think that that would kind of take me out of the movie you know if it was a more <laughs> Well, if yeah. it was a more like stylized movie, I could see you kind of getting away with that. Yeah. But yeah. this movie does, you know, it's you hear this this term thrown around so much that I think it's almost become useless. But I think it fits with this movie, and I think it does fit with Halloween. Is magical realism, you know, like it yeah. seems like it does take place in our world, but with one supernatural element in it, which is yeah. the car. It's a very, it's a very, very good point. Yeah, he doesn't. He, you're right. It, it would have been an interesting and totally different choice if all of a sudden he had had like a '50s style leather jacket and and like was wearing a handkerchief or something. I don't know. I, you know, whatever. Yeah, it'd be too on the nose. Whatever look he could be adopting. Yeah, no, it's a it's a totally good point, and it's also it's you're right by showing him wearing clothes that are probably in his own closet. He's just coordinating the colors differently. It gives you a look that's very unique to him, and and seems like something a, a kid could pull together. Yeah, no, it's totally true. So basically, the 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 second half of the middle of the film is taken up with uh, getting with killing members of the gang that bullied Arnie and then 
beat Christine to shit. So they tore that car apart. And that's when we learn that Christine really does have super duper magic powers. Um, and and this is this is a scene where we first see her powers because he he comes into the garage, the car is completely demolished. And she starts to rebuild herself. And John Carpenter does some neat camera tricks. It's a really cool scene where where uh, Arnie steps back and he goes, ah, you have magic powers. It's not lying. But then he goes, you know, show me. And Carpenter does this thing with a crane where... Well, because, he, because he had looked away and all of a sudden when he looked back, the engine had been rebuilt. So he's yeah. like, oh, okay. So he backs off and he says, show me. Yeah. So then you've got the, your, your camera angle that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, the camera does this thing where it it starts over Arnie's shoulder or maybe around his side. But anyway, it lifts up in a crane over him as the car starts to do its special effects and and, and put itself back together, which are wonderful, by the way. Julia, it's you had a point about the practicality. Too. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love, I mean, that's the thing is that to me, the way that they used to, I've said this before, but the practical effects that they used to do much more than they do now, some of them they still do, but um, now there's so much relying on, on computer graphics, which is fine, I guess, but I just love the practical effects. And this one is so cool because they have like this hydraulic pump thing or whatever it is that they put on the inside that stucks, I, th- I think what it said is that it stucks in the walls of the car and they had a plastic car that, that they'd made or at least the front of it. So it crunches all up, and then, of course, they run it backwards, so it's undoing as, as it's pushing out. But yeah. it's such a great effect. I just loved it. And, um, yeah, and then he's just watching this car just, you know, put itself back together, and it's just amazing. And he's not There's freaked one. out by it at all, which is why you know that he's, you know, it, he's been basically possessed by it. Because obviously she didn't do this when the first time he fixed her up. He actually did that work. No, he had to own. earn it. He, didn't he had to earn it by fixing that car up himself. Yeah. I think that's yeah. I think that's the deal. Yeah. Right. You know. Um and then the car goes out on a killing spree and and goes and so the, the next couple scenes you are know, really just bent on revenge. Go ahead. I haven't watched this this movie in a long time. And as you know, I I, I brought it up on a couple of their podcasts. But like I, I'm a, I'm a car accident survivor. I have some 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 post traumatic issues with with car stuff in movies sometimes, and I was a little concerned about watching this movie because you know I was like I don't remember if watching this movie was upsetting to me or not. Uh-huh. And I I gotta say you know Julie was talking about how like this movie they had to really work to get an R rating on this. Like this movie is not despite the fact that you have a car like mowing people down. This movie is not that violent, and the only thing that that I thought was was really kind of disturbing with the level of violence was when the car literally smashes into this you know gas station and it catches yeah. on fire. Then this flaming car comes yeah. out of <laughs> the of the the um the yeah it's out of the fire out of the gas, gas station gas... and runs this guy down and leaves a flaming body in its way. <laughs> and it's 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 it, that's a really scary scene, but you know at the same time I'm I'm in complete awe of that. Like first of all, that flaming car is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 yes, Christine on fire is literally just so well done. That was beautiful. Well, you hear the phrase "hell on wheels." Well, there you go. I mean, yeah, come yeah, on. yeah. Well, that that and when it's stalking the like the one of the gang members and it's going down the alley and he's like playing cat and mouse. All of that stuff, super great and well shot well paced uh you know for someone who didn't initially want to do this movie carpenter really when it comes time for cars to do bad things he's got it down pat like all those sequences are super great and just you know horror iconic moments again the flaming car is really stands out chasing people down (laughs) leaving like you said you know burning bodies and even when it comes back when it comes limping back and it's just smoldering. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like the garage, the guy's looking at it like, wait, how can this possibly, you know, who's driving this? That whole, all of that sequence too, done really well. Yeah. No, absolutely. So uh, the fact that Christine is killing off the gang members interests uh, Harry Dean Stanton. And uh, this is not a very big cast. So, you know, everybody's pretty memorable. Harry Dean Stanton shows up. He is a detective investigating uh, these murders, all of which seem to be suspiciously in the same gang that terrorized this one kid who is 
giving him lip and blowing him off. Uh, does Harry Dean Stanton know that Christina's magic? Who knows Christina's magic? Actually, this is my question. Who all in this film knows I mean, that Christine is a demon? I think he, Harry Dean Stanton people. shouldn't know it. There's no reason for him to know it, but he sure seems to suspect it. Because when yeah. he comes upon the car at the school, when he's coming to, ch- to track down... Um, track down Arnie to see where he was when uh, the first one of the, you know, the 70s gang was killed. He um, he looks at the car and he's like, well, this car doesn't look like it's been, had the crap yeah. eaten out of it like everybody said, because he had told his parents and, he, and the girlfriend had seen it. And he's like, uh, starts asking, like, well, what, you know, how did you, how did this happen? How did you fix it? Where, where's the paint? Where's the receipt? So it's, uh, he's interrogating him about not believing that he actually fixed the car, which doesn't make any sense unless you believe this car is magical. Because <laughs> otherwise, why would yeah. you, you know, be assuming that, that he didn't actually fix the car, you know? Yeah, that's so. absolutely right. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it, I can, in world, I can give an explanation that doesn't involve him believing in the demon car, where it's just that he's just trying to chase down all the details and seeing if yeah. he can make the kid nervous. But having said that, by the end of the film, he's totally down with the car of being course. magic. You know, and, and oh, and by the way, that, and I know we're not to the end of the film yet, but what no, the we hell can, we can, we can not, go to the end. What the hell uh, are they thinking not dumping that that car cube into the bottom of the ocean? That's oh, so yes. stupid. Okay, <laughs> so the, the the end of the movie involves a standoff. Act three begins when uh, when Lee, which is Alexandra Paul, and uh, Dennis um, decide they have got to deal with that car and kill it once and for all if they can't free Arnie. So they set up a showdown in the garage. Uh and and which Arnie and Christine definitely go to for no other reason really than I guess because he scratched it into you know, it, it was he did damage to Christine. He goes, you know, meet me at midnight or whatever at the at the the garage. But also because it's Act Three, and so everybody has to gather for it. And the, I mean, seriously, the the movie suddenly sort of clicks into place. You're like, well, we know that when that that door comes down on the garage, we're all going to be in this place, and the whole rest of the film is going to play out uh, here. And it's going to be a showdown between these two teens who are our final heroes and Arnie inside of Christine. Um, and, uh, and that's, and it's actually a good scene. You know, it, it's a, it's a tense scene. There's, you know, they do, a, they do a lot of business with getting from place to place or the guy using a big uh, backhoe to, well, it's not a backhoe. I, I don't even know what you call this, uh, this bulldozer. It's a bulldozer. Is it a bulldozer? I apologize. Um, yeah. The guy using this bulldozer to protect Alexandra Paul from the car that is trying to bash her. At this point, Arnie is behind the wheel of this car. And so he's completely insane. He's, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, he's, he's definitely trying to kill Alexandra Paul and, um, and no mistake. Uh, does. And by Christine... the way, during that scene, um, Alexandra Paul has a twin sister and she sent her twin sister in to, to fake out, uh, John Carpenter and be in that scene. And really? it's, he said it was like, uh, that it was really freaky because it was like she was, you know, her, but not her. So it was just kind of a weird, like they didn't quite know it to make it. I don't even know if they knew she had a twin, but I thought that was kind of funny. That's, that's really cool. Uh, does Christine mean to kill Arnie or is this an accident? What, what, somebody explain the end to me. I think that's Arnie's doing, honestly. No, I don't think Christine means to kill Arnie. Arnie Arnie smashes into an embankment and gets thrown through the windshield and and of course dies from his injuries there that's so, actually yeah, a really that, horrible scene because he pulls yeah. that piece of glass out of him and the actor just howls and howls and howls yeah yeah he does boy it is uh it is pretty rough uh and yeah so i i, I guess you're right christine definitely doesn't mean to do it I don't. I'm not clear on if Arnie means to do it, but regardless, Christine has now lost her beloved driver, so she's alone, and they now fight. And he with forgives Christine. her. He forgives her because he looks at her like very tenderly and just touches her like before he. Yeah, dies, I don't think he like, meant. Oh, okay. I don't think she meant to do it. I, th- I think it's a total accident. But anyway, now it's them against the demon car, and they manage to overtake her Wolverine powers by just crushing her kind of too much with this bulldozer and then uh they they kill the car and that's and that's as joya points out they then crunch it down to 
to a little, you know, squished uh, car block and drop it in the dumpster. Um, and I think it's abundantly clear that this demon's not dead. There's no reason to think that this, you know, it's, we're left, we're left, first of all, with a Scooby-Doo gag, where for a moment, you know, rock and roll plays and they freak out. And then this guy in the junkyard is walking by. It's actually with more his, thoroughbred. Is it really? Yeah. Oh yeah, my yeah. gosh, that's awesome. So, that's... Here's a random thing. George Thurgood actually once stayed with my parents. Did he but... really? <laughs> He was famous. So they were at um, this blues festival. Uh, I think it's in Huntsville, Kerrville. Anyway, in the hill country. Uh, and he was like, oh, man, I got to take a bus. And my parents were like, oh, you can come to stay with us overnight. We'll bring you to the bus station. You can. You don't have to leave right now and miss all this awesome blues you know, stuff. And he was telling them, oh, I got this band, the Destroyers, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, he just, before... You know, bad to the bone. He came. Oh, and they said the funniest thing was he thought the word like they passed by one. He thought the word washateria was hilarious. That's wonderful. Weird, bizarre world, like word. I mean, and but yeah, they're like, oh yeah. So then, like you know, years later, song comes on. They're like, Wait, is that that guy who stayed at our place after the blue show? It's like, oh yeah, imagine that. So yeah, that is that is really awesome. I love George Thorogood, by the way. That, that's, um, that's a good story. So yeah, they they uh, he, it's exactly what they used to do with Gleek the Monkey on Super Friends. You know, suddenly here comes some noise or or a shadow rising up. They're like, oh, the monster is back. Oh no, it's Gleek the Monkey. Uh-huh. Or in this case, it's George Thorogood. Yeah. But Walking when they with, leave, Walking by with a jam box. But of course, the cube starts to move. Like obviously, Christine's going to rebuild herself, which is why I say they should have chained a bunch of concrete blocks to her and dumped her into the bottom of the ocean. I'm sorry, that was just Absolutely. stupid, stupid, stupid for them to just leave her there. Even if it takes her a well, month to in the book, yeah, in the book, some of the members of the the bully gang yeah. survive. And there's an epilogue where you know, football hero is older and he's a he's a junior high school teacher and he's reading an obituary that that uh, one of the old bully gang has been run over by a car and he ponders uh, that Christine has rebuilt herself and is is gunning for revenge still that's Uh-oh. wonderful <laughs> Oh, that's yeah. I mean, oh, by the way, I found the I found the line about um, the John, John Carpenter and the Alexander Paul's twin sister. It says he 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 said it was like invasion of the body snatchers, and Alexander was a pod person. <laughs> that's that's was really, really funny. funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So that's that's Christine. Uh. Well, so let's get our final thoughts. I think we started with Tony. Um. So yeah. Tony, uh, I, I don't know what we may not have talked about, but um, uh, what are your final thoughts or anything else that you want to throw in about Christine and also about returning, I guess, to the Stephen King retrospective? I Yeah, I really enjoy the movie. I think it's done really well. Um, you know, anybody who's, if you followed us for a while, I mean, we're big Carpenter fans. And I, you know, I'd kind of forgotten this was his movie. Me too. Um, I hadn't yeah. seen it in forever. And yeah, it's got all the great bits. Um, I love his soundtrack work. So all that works for me. Um, I think as a movie, the I agree with Drew that the changes make it more ambiguous and a little different. I, I wish, I kind of do wish there was a little bit of that creepiness that's in the book, but I don't know if it would work in the way that he and the screenwriter told this story. Um, I think you have to go, you know, you have to go for it. If you kind of sit in the middle, it's not, it's just going to not be that great. So going for the story that he did, I think was really cool, but the book definitely like there are some <clears throat> just creepy moments that I'd love to see. You know, I'd love to see an adaptation of just that kind of that. That would be really. Give me an explanation of that. What do you mean by that, Tony? Because I, I so obviously have only read the first. Have the original owner and he's the descriptions. I mean, King is so great at just like gut wrenching descriptions of things. Huh. Um, though there's this thing, and they they t- you know he has these uh, turns of phrase. Like the yeah. the shitter one is one, but yeah, there's weird, turns right? of phrase that he uses, and that's when Dennis starts to go like where is this guy coming like where what's going on with arnie arnie starts to use those uh phrases and the possession storyline and just how how the car does what it does the they if i remember correctly i I seem to want to say that whenever he's in the car he describes you know king describes the smells and how that all works and his description of the decrepit nature 
the rotting nature of the original owner Roland um you know all of that stuff is is really just like whoa it's unsettling in a way that King is really good at and so in some ways as a horror movie I wish they could have incorporated that but I think what Carpenter and um you know the screenwriter has done here I should really in the future write down notes because I think the screenwriters should get more credit so my bad on that um but I I think that what what they've created is something that's a really good adaptation that takes it in a different way but still remains effective as a you know car revenge story um that's still supernatural enough that makes it really cool by the way the the screenwriter was bill phillips who i don't know but we may very Sorry. well know stuff my apologies do, so. to bill phillips for not saying your name every time because as a writer I'd be better about that outstanding all right uh julia um your final thoughts on christine well i mean i've enjoyed the conversation because i enjoy every time we turn a movie into a uh, a uh, metaphor for addictions and <laughs> relationships and narcissists and all those things that I love talking about. So, uh, so that's been a lot of fun. But no, I mean, it has some. I like I said, I think it's it could have been really stupid given you know the the idea of a possessed car, and I'm sure there have been plenty of possessed car movies that are pretty stupid. But um, no, it's done very well, um, both because it's Stephen King and because it's John Carpenter. So, uh, you know, I really enjoy it. I think it's um, it's interesting, and I can't really think of anything that just bugged me about it or that I would have necessarily changed. So that's a good sign. So, yeah, I enjoyed it. Excellent. Uh, Drew, any final thoughts? You know, when, when I compare this to the book and the film, it's, it's not meant to be demeaning to the book. I think the book works very well. I think that the changes made here make the movie more cinematic. You know, I think the stuff that King does in the the book works very well in a book. And, you know, movies and books are not the same. And that's why adaptations of books, you know, I always get a little upset when people who, when people, you know, want just a slavish adaptation. Because, you know, there's, there's... Like for example, you know, look, my my, my all time favorite book is, is is Dracula, and I know you know Jason also loves 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 Dracula, probably loves Dracula more than than anybody could possibly love Dracula, and <laughs> there's been more adaptations of that than just about anything, and you know some of them are good and some of them are bad. But that's a, because that, the way that book is structured, it makes it hard to do a pure adaptation because it's done in in a, a certain style. And, you know, like I said, some things work very well in, in book form. I think that this is a very smart adaptation of King's novel, and it's got a lot of the, the Carpenter flourishes that we associate with it. And I, I think you, you were very correct, Jason, to say that this is a good marriage of sensibilities. And, 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 you know, I think maybe the only director that really might, might top King and being a good or top carpenter and being a good match for King is, is probably George Romero who, mm. who did more than, more than one Stephen King adaptation. And yeah. I, I think that this is a really top notch movie. And, you know, if you're interested in, and in particular, you know, 80s horror, you know, particularly horror from the early 80s, I think this is a really interesting film to watch. I have to yeah. jump in here before Jason talks and uh, say about the Dracula thing that, um, that the other day our, our youngest child goes, um, so I don't know if you've read, uh, if you've read the book Dracula. <laughs> and I'm like, your dad's like one of the foremost experts in the world on the book Dracula. In fact, he was, I think Jason goes, yeah, I'm actually um, quoted in an introduction to one of <laughs> oh I love God. that they've made it this far. So and like, yeah. I read Dracula, like a child. A child. <laughs> let me tell you, about Dracula. It was really funny. Like, let me stop you there, and now I should tell you <laughs> of Dracula. You're gonna want milk and cookies or some some kind of snack. We're about to have the Dracula talk. <laughs> About to have the Dracula talk. Have well, you talked well, to your Dracula kids talk. about Dracula? Yeah. <laughs> no, it is funny. I guess we'd never really uh, discussed it, but yeah, I do have yeah, a. You've never uh, had the Dracula talk till now. I, I do have an addition <laughs> of Dracula. Your, your Lord and Savior, Dracula. <laughs> yeah. Christ. 
Have a moment. Yeah, uh, Drew said it exactly right. And I would say in the course of time that we've been doing this show, my feelings about adapt about adapting Dracula have changed considerably from what they were initially. When I was um, I mean, in the in past years of doing this show, but even really, if I think of like, since I was in college, when I was in college, I really had a sort of unrealistic idea about what a, a good adaptation of Dracula is. And since then, I've kind of, I've, I've changed all my feelings about what an adaptation of anything is, you know, so that, so that now I'm much more liberal in, in what, you know, I'm much more interested in, does it capture a kind of a feeling or a thesis of what the work is about or even what the work makes makes the director think about and as long as it works i'm kind of in support of that mainly because when you think about it the better you get to know a particular work the more you realize that successfully capturing it on film is essentially impossible they're two different kinds of work and that's and that's fine which, uh you know which is good because Lava Shark is actually an adaptation of The Tempest. Yes. Um, if, you, if, you really, if you really get down to it. Um, is it Lava Shark or Fire Shark? I thought it was Fire Shark. Is it Lava Shark? Fire um, Shark is Lava Shark's cousin. Yes. <laughs> Either way, it's the shark that burns. It is the shark that burns. This sounds like an STD. This makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, man. So... <laughs> I mean, a burning shark whose internals are lava should probably make you uncomfortable. I don't think you're wrong <laughs> in that. If what we is... doesn't, somebody's not done their job correctly. But see, now no. we've been watching Christine, and we saw Christine like rolling down the street, chasing after somebody on fire. Like that gives Fire Shark a whole new visual for me. <laughs> like well, Fire Shark would be so junction. awesome. Chasing after people on fire. <laughs> especially in conjunction with Drew's idea. Yeah. 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 The, the crossover. The crossover event is going to be something yep. amazing. Sci-Fi <laughs> Channel, you can just send us a check because you know you're going to want to option all of this oh, shit. Christ. Yep. Listen, man, you could write that script in six weeks. You could do it. Bam! I'm telling you, I, 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 I have a feeling you would find you would find somebody ready to part with pesos for Fire Shark. You know. It maybe is up literally to... pesos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, maybe we could just crowdfund the Lava Shark movie. I think we've got a stay. If we just go back through, we've got a stable of. We're in for a, a production company. I don't know how good of a production company. <laughs> maybe more Corman than yep. you know anything else. But <laughs> there you go. All right. Having said all that, uh, final thoughts. I actually don't have any. You guys did it wonderfully. This was beautiful. This is my final thought. I, I, these lower budget Stephen. Well, this is not a low budget, but my point is, it's it has a small scope. It's one small town. Kind of to be honest with you, I can watch any one of these films that takes place in a small town, presents us with a world and a supernatural creature i i it's maybe it's as i get older and or as i watch more and more horror movies i'm beginning to enjoy the stories the smaller and smaller they get i don't know i i i gotta i gotta ponder that some more regardless i like the scope of christine and and i i really did enjoy doing this film let's get endorsements i'm curious what you guys have been reading thinking about watching uh over the past um well week since we recorded our piranha 2 episode tony do you have anything to endorse for us we got a couple things um okay I saw a documentary last night called uh who the fuck is that guy and it's about <laughs> michael alaga who uh started as a gay guy in uh new york going to clubs and eventually became a music a r person and uh producer who uh signed metallica to electra and uh you know he started as a, uh there's a band called the dead boys who started as a run the fan club for them and it's a lot about uh new york during this certain time period um he signed uh white zombie so there's a lot of, you know, stuff like that. Wow. Cindy Lauper is on it. Um, it's also about, you know, he loved music and he loved metal and he his roster of bands that he signed was amazing. But also, um, you know, they touch on metal being a very, you know, dudely kind of thing. And then you've got all these metal bands who then go into Michael Alago's office, who's, you know, hmm. very, uh, very flamboyant guy and is, you know throwing away all that and all talking about music as a commonality um and then you know kind of where he goes and 
you know, they touch on a lot of different things. It was a really, I thought it was really cool. Um, I didn't really know much about him. I mean, I'm sure he was mentioned in, you know, books and biographies and stuff like that. But uh, it was a really interesting uh, character piece. Um, uh, a person who loves music and, you know, isn't a kind of what a lot of A&R people turned into to be very schmarmy and sign this deal and, you know, aha, we've locked you in and, uh, you know, all the, the bad parts of the music industry, I'm sure parts of those happen, but um, it's a totally different take on that, on just a um, a person who became a really important person in the music industry that I didn't really know much about. Um, and it's on Netflix. I thought it was fascinating. Also, I kind of want to do this movie eventually once we leave King, but this Christine made me want to do the Wraith. Yeah. <laughs> in the 80s. I mean, if you thought the fashions in this and Christine were steeped in the 80s, everything about the Wraith is 80s, 80s, 80s. And yeah. now I really kind of want to do that movie. Um, I think there's a lot of like fun nostalgia and coolness. Um, definitely, it's not a Carpenter movie, but I think I, I say watch it and hopefully eventually we'll do the Wraith. I would like to. And we should, you know, we should do the Wraith and we should do it back to back with the car. Oh, I think that's a wonderful idea. That's a killer idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I know. <laughs> Julia, so did you have anything to endorse this week? Um, I can't really think of anything I want to endorse, but I do want to say happy birthday to Jason since on the East Coast it's his birthday now. So. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. Oh, well. Oh, <laughs> can I selfishly mention, and I apologize for horning in on Julia, mm. I, um, this past week has been really rough. Uh, especially for friends of mine on the coast. And mm. um, I think, you know, multiple states were hit, but my friends in Houston, really, um, I knew a lot of people who were affected by the hurricane. Mm -hmm. And both people getting evacuated who were okay and people who got evacuated who came back to nothing. Um, yeah. If there's a way to help people in Houston, um, I advocate for that. We donated here. Um, it was really bad for a lot of people. And... Um, if you can help at all, please do, because it, like I said, it affected a lot of friends of mine. Um, when you meet enough people, you know, from all over, you go to conventions, I've been to, you know, go to, you know, being a musician, meeting different bands and my circle of, uh, people that I know has increased in that area over the past few years. And it was really rough seeing some of their stories and just, even if it's somebody you don't know, like the devastation, uh, is really bad. And so if you can help. Um, let's, you know, I definitely implore you to do so. Uh, it had, like, it's, it's pretty awful and devastating. Um, and it hits really close. So. Yeah, that absolutely. I concur with that. And, um, don't just send, uh, you know, clothes from your closet. Cause that's, that can be overwhelming for donation centers to deal with, but, um, you know, money, there's certain lists that people have where they're looking for, they're looking for baby wipes, or they're looking for new underwear, or they're looking for whatever. And then, so if you're going to send a, a thing, then make sure you check and see what they need. But, um, or if you can go and, and help, you know, make sure you're going to a place where that's good, that needs volunteers. But, uh, yeah, it is, it's a, I mean, disaster is an understatement. And now we're looking at Irma showing up potentially here in the next, uh, next week and maybe doing another number on the East Coast. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, there's nothing, nothing good to be said about it. So please do help if you can. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Drew, did you have anything to endorse? I actually have several things. Um, okay. First off, just, you know, relating back to the episode on a whole, uh, get on Netflix, go to Futurama, look up The Haunting, which is an episode of Futurama that, uh, for one, it spoofs the Wolfman and uh, American Werewolf in London heavily, but it also really, 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 really does some really great stuff spoofing uh, Christine because the plot of the episode is that Bender becomes a wear car. <laughs> and oh, that one's great. It, yeah. It is amazing. And I think it would be a good thing for anybody who has just watched this movie to to go rewatch that so that's my that is my uh, centered to the episode um endorsement a kind of related endorsement is uh because it, it is a a a shall we say older older woman middle-aged woman reflecting on teen rebellion uh, I, I, I'm mentioning Sadie Saturday Night, which is the new album by Jean Caffeine, and who some of you might know because she appeared in uh, in Slacker, 
Um, so she just put this out. I was uh, I was ill, so I didn't get to say that I got as much out of it as I could have. But I was actually just at the record release party on Friday uh, because Jamie, my wife, who has also appeared on the show uh, many, many times, does backing vocals on three songs on this album, and she got up and she she you know sang along with her her band at, at the at the show, and it's 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 punk rock, but not like punk rock as we think of it now. This is very much like punk rock in the style of like New York 1970s punk rock. Like it's 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 more yeah well not even, no pre that it's it's like. Lou Reed, uh, you know, early, early talking heads, you know, Richard Hell, like that kind of vibe. And, Mm -hmm. you know, like it's it's definitely not like the sort of like hardcore or pop punk, but it's a really interesting sound. It's also, you know, but the the lyrics are done in a different way because it's it's reflective on being young in that point in, in our history. And I think it's an interesting album because of that um my last endorsement is as i mentioned i have I, i've been very sick off and on uh the last few weeks well no no small part and do uh because i <laughs> i was or- walking around in extremely damp clothing and refrigerated meat lockers uh, a lot this this the, the the weekend prior to this because of all the rain we got from harvey um so I was spending a lot of time in bed this last week, and one of my constant enjoyment is the YouTube channel NerdSync, which is a channel that is completely devoted to uh, analysis or history of comics. They have a lot of really great videos that have to do with, uh, you know, costume design. Uh, they, they just put up a really good 40-minute uh, long, albeit, uh, review of the Defenders uh, Netflix series that just came out. Uh, they have some really great uh, episodes that are the history of Archie comics. But their their motto is making you smarter through the awesomeness of comics, and I think that that is absolutely true, because there's certainly been some videos that I've watched uh, that have definitely made me look at characters in different ways. And uh, Scott, the guy that hosts it, is based out of Dallas, so I think that's even cooler that it's something that exists in Texas. And again, like it really got me through through this week of like feeling like absolute dog meat, like through through 90% of it was just to sit here and watch like all these episodes of Nerd Sync. So I I just can't say uh, enough good things about this channel. So just go on YouTube and search Nerd Sync. And it'll come up. Wonderful. Julia, you I'm sorry, I, I don't even know did you get to do an endorsement or you um you, no, you, you talked to me? Yeah. I didn't have one. Okay. I just had a birthday wish. Okay. Yes. yes. That's wonderful. Okay, uh, I <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I'm endorsing Jason Henderson. <laughs> right. And 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 knowing what to give. So that that was that was really great. Uh okay, actually mine uh goes back a ways and had no particular connection with now. It's just something I got into. Uh I reread Joan Lindsay's book The Picnic at Hanging Rock, which uh was made into a film by by Peter Weir. Uh, I guess in the late 1970s, the book came out. Um, I can't, I can't remember when I, I, the movie came out in 1975. The book came out a couple of years before that, but anyway, it's an Australian book about the girls at this, this nice uh, countryside, all girls school uh, or so-called college, which they call it. And a bunch of teenage girls go on a hike and, you know, it's a big picnic Four of the girls go on a hike up this rock formation and um, they turn a corner and disappear. And, you know, one of them comes back down screaming because she saw the girls sort of start to act weirdly and as if their feet were floating. It's a very strange sort of story. And then uh, the, the girls apparently went through, a, you know, around a corner and, and vanished off the face of the earth. And the rest of the book is about trying to investigate what happened to the girls. You know, were they abducted? Did they... Did they disappear? Was there something magical? Was there something criminal? Were they squished by rocks? Um, and it's a very strange book, and it became this this very strange movie. And uh, uh, I I wanted to go back and read it because I remembered what a haunting film it was. Apparently, it's now 
being made. It might already be out as an Australian television miniseries. But uh, yeah, The Picnic at Hanging Rock was a very interesting uh, novel to read. And it's so funny because I read all these new books all the time. This one I was going, you know, back uh, for no particular reason to one from from uh, the late 60s and early 70s. So uh, uh, if you've never heard of it, you should check out The Picnic at Hanging Rock because it's a, it's definitely a, a cult film. Um, there's something just beautiful about something that's spooky and the fact that the sun is just banging down the way it, the way it does out there and um so that was that was my endorsement of the week is joan Lindsay's book uh, the picnic at hanging rock hanging rock is a real rock formation by the way they have a statue of the character the you know one of the main girls disappearing and in fact it's been this ongoing argument among culture vultures in australia as to whether it's appropriate to have a statue to a fictional character uh you know at this uh, at this you know very real place so um yeah okay so that's the end of the beginning of our new stephen king retrospective we're going to be back with some more uh and very very soon maybe it's next week we're going to be doing the brand new uh it in fact we'll be discussing it the very weekend that it comes out so uh i'm looking forward to it if it's next week then it means we need to get ourselves out we're looking watch. forward to it i'm looking forward to it and that's going to be i think maybe next weekend so if you're listening then uh, be sure and stick around. If uh, you've been around for a while, bring your friends, let them uh, know about the show, leave reviews on iTunes. That really, really matters. And in fact, if you leave one in the next week or so, I will look for it. And if I see there's a new one there, I will read it. It would be so fun to like read one of the reviews. So say whatever you want, unless it's truly, truly awful, in which case I'll just rewrite it and read it differently on the show. Because my God, that <laughs> you mean you're going to read it on the podcast, not you're just going to read it in general. Oh, no, I'll read it on the podcast. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Whatever, whatever crazy, crazy ass thing they want to write, I will, I will read it if it's an iTunes review and it comes in the next week. So, <laughs> uh, you know. All right. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic week. And um, and if you have Labor Day off, I, I hope you enjoy Labor Day weekend. Bye, guys. Good night. Bye. Bye.